Sun Kim and Elizabeth Sophia Lee. Welcome to the Globe Church Project. Thank, well, thank you. you. Thank you for having us. And it's great to be here in Australia. Yeah. What have you enjoyed most about your time in Australia? I really like the beaches so far. There's so many. Yeah. More than I expected. So yeah. it's and it's stunning. It's not just like an ordinary beach. Yeah. you got the cliffs and the sand and the rocks. So it's quite stunning. Yeah, I'm a little bit biased, of course, but um, I think it's a very beautiful city. Um, Australia won us over, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The most beautiful so far I've ever seen in the world. Yeah. Not that I've been everywhere, but so far. And you've seen quite a few of the beaches and spots in Sydney. What was your favourite? I think definitely Bondi Beach, mm. which we saw yesterday. Um, I didn't expect it to be so big, and because it's the winter time and not a lot of people are out. It's pretty bare and it seemed really nice. It kind of seemed like we had the whole beach to ourselves. And then we actually got to meet one of the Bondi rescue lifeguards. <laughs> so we got a picture with him, which was um, unexpected, but a nice yeah. surprise. <laughs> all over Facebook. I checked him out today, all over Facebook. So. <laughs> It was quite interesting to meet him. Yeah. That was totally unexpected. So thank you, Graham, for <laughs> uh, knocking on the door and for taking us to Bondi Beach. And actually, that walk uh, to uh, Koji Beach was so beautiful. I, I can't believe that even exists, like that walk. And so to get that whole kind of uh, view from different perspectives and the other beaches along the way, that was most stunning, so mm -hmm. very good exercise, and it was so clean and beautiful, and mm -hmm. not that many people around, so that was quite yeah. excellent. Yeah, it's one of the benefits of doing it in winter, actually, because mm -hmm. it's warm. And your winters aren't even that cold. No. <laughs> it's like our fall weather. It's not yeah. too cold, and there's not a lot of people, so it works out well. Yeah, and it didn't rain, it was mm -hmm. sunny, oh gosh, it was perfect in every way. Yeah. And you've written a book called Mother Daughter Speak. Can you tell us something about how did that book come about? My mother, she, she's an author already of many, many books, and just kind of whenever I was traveling, I would write little diary entries of my experience in the different cultures um, and my experience in ballet, since I've been doing that since I was three. And then after posting some of my stories on her blog, we kind of created this idea of maybe putting all these uh, reflections that I've made and compiling them all into one thing. So, yeah, that's exactly how it began. And it was very exciting. You know, it, uh, grandmas, you know, you've written many books. When you have an idea, it's very exciting, but then, it, uh, you know, going through with the idea is another thing. <laughs> so it took us a while. You know, she's busy with school and uh, ballet and all the other activities. But to be able to have that idea and to kind of still it and finish it. That was very exciting as a mother-daughter. You know, I don't know many authors who've been able to write with their daughters or if they're younger with their mothers. So this was quite a journey and, you know, the reflections uh, we wrote on similar topics. So Elizabeth wrote from her perspective as a teen and myself as a middle-aged woman. How did you choose the topics? Because there's a broad range about, you know, family, love, racism, church, faith. How did you end up choosing all those topics? A lot of those lessons are already uh, prevalent in our lives. So we knew we wanted to touch on things that we both can relate to and things that we have both experienced. So for the racism, for example, my mother's an immigrant and uh, she experienced a lot growing up uh, in Canada and I didn't realize how we could relate on that level. I mean, I've definitely, my experience with prejudice has been sugar-coated in a way as a second generation immigrant, but um, to be able to relate to my mom in that, um, on that level, it's very, I think it, it bonded us even more. Yeah. And the thing is, the topics that we cover, as you mentioned, you know, racism, intergenerational love, and then climate change, those are all, issues that she's concerned with and I am. So she did a lot of stuff on uh, sustainability around the city of Bethlehem. 
So it was kind of natural. I think you always have to write something that you're excited about or something that's close to your heart. Yeah. And it just so happens that those are kind of important topics for all people. It's not just Elizabeth and me, but you know, today we're concerned about climate change, we're concerned about immigrants and racism and relationships. Those are all. So it just worked out something that she was interested in, I was, and for the wider society. And I like the way that you address each of the topics from your own story and experience as well. Because we were also writing from a Christian perspective, we included the scriptural passages. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we dug through scripture to kind of relate it so it can be used as a study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in a church mm -hmm. or so. What's the secret to successful mother-daughter relationship? <laughs> I'm sure there's more than one secret, but um, <laughs> what, about, what are some of the things that you've learned? Um, I think at the beginning, um, <laughs> I was very culturally lost. I didn't have a, a sturdy relationship with my Korean culture and heritage. And from this experience, I think I definitely learned about my mom, more about my mom in this, in the couple of years that we wrote this and the entirety of my life. Um, and just being able to uh, learn about my mom's history and where she's come from definitely uh, grew my cultural connection. And, yeah. Yeah. and then you get to appreciate because her perspectives are a little different. So it's just fun. And you know, you write them and then you edit them and edit them over and over again. But um, I think kind of understanding one another. And I know today, you know, particularly daughters and mothers, there's always that tension at every age of the of our life cycle. So I'm hoping that what we can show, um, people can realize that, you know, it doesn't have, everything doesn't have to be so harsh. You know, you can take it easy, like the Aussies take it so easy <laughs> and relaxing and just, you know, enjoying it. Because I know, um, just looking around me, there's so much tension around mother-daughters. So um, it was good to kind of see from her perspective. So I'm hoping that readers can see, you know, every generation has a different perspective on the similar topics and how can we kind of tackle them. I don't think there's really a secret into uh, how you can work together, like the mother-daughter relationship. I think it's so different. The dynamic can be different between each mother and daughter pair. And ours was not necessarily perfect either. I think especially if we're working together on something like this, there can there can be a lot of tension and there can be um, challenges, but in the end when you overcome these uh, obstacles, it's definitely rewarding and worth all of the trouble, I guess. <laughs> what was your experience growing up as a Korean in Canada? Um, so I've talked about it and written about it a lot, but those experiences of racism are still very clear. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm middle-aged now, and that happened so long ago. But it's very clear because what people do and what people say have long-lasting effects. So, um, you know, there's really no excuse for people to make fun of or uh, belittle other people because they look so different and or come from different backgrounds and ethnicities. So they have had a large impact because it was racism growing up. Um, I grew up in a small city, London, Ontario, uh, which is about two and a half hours from Toronto. So Toronto is a larger city, but London, Ontario, predominantly white society um, in the 1970s. So it wasn't easy growing up. And how different is the second generation experience? Much more diverse society today. I think so, yeah. Even in Bethlehem, it's predominantly white as well. And so I did experience a little bit of prejudice, but it wasn't at all to the extent of which my mom experienced. I think as generations are coming, there's a lot more acceptance and uh, just less discrimination in general. I think I've been very lucky in my experience. But having said that, we, have, we can't um, disregard the systemic racism. Yeah. So that's a scary thing, because when we look at our American past, you know, the Japanese have been there for generations, six, seven generations, but during the war, you know, they were rounded up and put into intern, internment 
camps. So things like that happen because racism is still a system that, you know, the Japanese lost everything. They, were they weren't quite citizens, but they have lived in the land for generations, but still that happens. So even though the experience is made different, it may be less harsh, it might not be as explicit, I don't think we can disregard the racism that still is very systemic in American society. And I'm sure in many white dominant societies uh, where white privilege and white supremacy exists. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in a moment, but you also write about intersectionality, so that the, the gender and the race issues sometimes can intersect yeah. in your experience as well. Oh yeah, so um, intersectional theology that I call wrote with Susan Shaw, um, that there are, you know, it's just not one identity, so she's not just Korean American woman, but you know, we also have the class issue, the gender, the sexuality, sexual orientation, um, ethnicity, all those things, ableism, and you know, that makes up one's identity and you can be higher up and lower down and there's so many complications, but it's important to think in intersectional terms mm -hmm. and not just as a single issue. One of the things that you talk about in the book is the importance of um, elders, um, significant people in your life, often they're family members, but not always family members. Mm -hmm. Aside from your relationship with your mother, who, who are some of the elders in your life? A grandmother or somebody else that have made an impact on you and how what impact did they make? Um, so particularly my mom's mom. So my grandmother or harmony as you would say in Korean, um, she was definitely a significant female figure in my life and kind of acted as another mother when my own mother was away traveling because you know she did that a lot for work. And um, I actually dealt with a lot of uh, skin condition issues when I was growing up. I had severe eczema as a toddler and into my preteen years and it was very diff difficult for me I think growing up and uh, when my grandmother was with us staying in Bethlehem she always took care of me and was always cognizant of the kind of food she fed me, what kind of clothes I was wearing, the temperature in the room, um, doing really anything she could just so I could be um, content and not yeah. have my skin reacting in any way. Um, and she, I, there's no, <laughs> there's no real words to express how grateful I am because she was so significant in my childhood and, um, but she passed away when I was 10 years old from stage four lung cancer. So I can't, express my gratitude to her anymore, yeah. um, at least face to face, but, you know, she definitely, um, I still have that respect for her as I did when I was younger, and I think that's just a small part of, um, that's just a small example for how Koreans will ex respect their elders. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, dancing and <laughs> theology. <laughs> um, so you're a dancer. Yes. Tell us about the life of a dancer. Um, it definitely varies between each person and the level of intensity that you choose to take it, um, and also the type of dance. So ballet is very um, classical and strict in a way that um, there's a specific style. And so my training was pre-professional training, um, and that required me to take classes four days a week and then also rehearsals for any performances that we had. So I danced every day after school. Um, so right after school, I would go to my studio. I would take a class for either two hours or three hours. And then if we were in season for rehearsals, I would do rehearsals right after those classes. Um, and then on the weekends, since I didn't have any school, we would have longer rehearsal um, schedules. And those varied between uh, two to six hours on the weekend. So it was intense for me as a student and as a pre-professional dancer, but it definitely kept me in shape and um, I, def I, I enjoyed it very much. What do you love most about dancing? I love being able to perform for others um, and also the community that I have at my studio. I know that a lot of studios can have tension or um, competition between the girls, but 
for me and my friends, we've developed a very strong relationship. Um, and as far as performing, I love being able to uh, make someone happy for a couple hours, you know, forget about the outside world. I think if you're watching any sort of art form, you kind of escape into what's happening on stage um, or what you're listening to. And being able to go outside into a lobby of the performance center after a performance and have little kids come up to me saying how much they enjoy my performance or how much they want to dance my role someday uh, to act as that role model to the younger generation is really rewarding and it's very exciting. And I really hope that those young kids are inspired and they can they want to join dance or anything at all, really. How do you hope that um, your dancing enriches the world? Dancing is unique in that you don't use words. And I think being able to express yourself just through your body movement is something unique. And um, I think because it is universal, there is no language. You can dance in any country and people can enjoy that. Um, I hope that it bonds people uh, even if they can't speak the same language, even if they don't understand their culture or wear the same clothes, I think it's just a great way. I mean, you go to a party and people are dancing. You go to a, a festival, people are dancing. Um, so really, it's, it's a great way for uh, relationships to grow, for people to understand, even if there are cultural differences. And how has um, your mother shared this dancing life and dream with you? <laughs> well, my mom, she, she always tells me that the reason she put me into ballet at, at age three was because she always wanted to dance when she was little but never had enough money or the resources in order to do that. And so I think through me, she is <laughs> my curiosity. I'm enjoying it. She's dancing through me. Um, yeah. But she's driven me to countless rehearsals and classes. And, you know, she's been paying and funding for my training and for my point shoes, which are not expensive. Um, which are expensive. I mean, yes, which expensive. are expensive. Yeah. That's what I meant to say. Yeah. <laughs> They're not cheap, is what yeah. I meant to say. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think she's definitely played a big part in my dancing career. Yeah. I want to ask you about a life of a writer and theologian. What's, a, what's that life look like? Oh, it's, you know, I, I sometimes go online to see how writers do it. And, you know, some people, they've set aside a couple hours a day to write. Um, and so the outside world sees that, I think. And they think that's the life of a writer. I don't know, Graham, that might be you. I think you have kind of more discipline than me. Why such a crazy life? I just write five minutes here and five minutes there. <laughs> in between waiting for her in the car or, you know, at the airport sitting at the gate. It's not like this set time. So when I have back, I don't even know how anything's ever written. Because it's so chaotically written. I don't kind of sit there for hours. Um, so it's not an ideal life that people may think um, it is for a life of a writer. It's more chaotic, and even my thoughts are chaotic. So when the book is done, I'm always amazed that it kind of makes any sense <laughs> because I'm just writing it a little bit here and a little bit there. So uh, I think from, I don't know about other writers, but I found um, life as a writer is not that easy. So I have a good friend, Don McKim, um, who's an editor, and he's written, I don't know, 30, 40 books. And he always tells me, you know, um, writing is hard, but once it's written, then it's a lot of joy, right? It's, having written is a lot, the feeling is good. So that always um, gives me joy once it's um, written and people are impacted. You know, just before the interview, I was reading, I didn't finish the whole email, but part of it was, you know, someone came on Tuesday night for our book launch and just expressing it'd be great to use the book in our church. So getting some message like that is always so rewarding, even if it's just one person <laughs> that you are able to impact through years of writing and editing and rewriting a book. It gives you joy, and I'm sure there's more. They don't all 
take the time to reach out or say something. But when strangers do that, um, I find it's rewarding. So, but the writing process is not fun. So even writing it together, you know, you have to go in sync and do it together. And Graham, you and I wrote Healing a Broken Humanity together. So we have to kind of be in sync together. And that's not hard. I mean, that's not easy. And you know, I've got friends who always wanted to write with another person. So not editing, but co-writing. You have dreams and then it just doesn't work out because the personalities may not fit and people argue of what goes in and what goes out. I know people have argued about like a semicolon, whether it exists or not in a sentence. <laughs> so it could be a nightmare, but I, but after it's done, and you know, Graham, our life is short, so when we pass away, hopefully the books will still have some life of its own, and it will continue to affect uh, generations. So, you know, our book is very simple. Hopefully um, it will continue to um, help people. People have emailed me even about our little book, but even the book that we co-wrote, Graham, um, Healing Our Broken Humanity, you know, I hope it's not just for this time and, you know, in our, in the night, you know, 2018, 1920, but for a long time to come that people will read it and understand that, you know, there are these difficulties in communities and uh, churches and perhaps what we have written will have an impact. And what are some of the ways that um, not only Elizabeth, but all of your children and your husband have shared this writing life and dream with you? <laughs> I don't know if they all have any writing life or dream, but they're all excited when I include their name in the acknowledgements. <laughs> <laughs> and there's always lots of fun, I don't know if it holding the book. <laughs> yeah, so I use my daughter predominantly because the boys are a little shy. <laughs> yeah. I love holding books and, yeah. and advertising. But she's going off to college, so I don't know how we're going to advertise <laughs> these books. So she held most of them, but I regret my first book came out in 2002 and she was just a little, little infant. And at that time, it wasn't digital camera. Was those other cameras, and I had the idea at that time to put the book beside her as an infant, and I never did, so I kind of lost that opportunity. <laughs> so I did. So I think there's two books where I don't have her uh, in the book holding it, but all the other ones she's holding my books are the boys. Oh, you have to post a copy to college and say, Yeah, you just... <laughs> let's just do it. I know, so she'll continue. But you know, I think the kids get a kick out of it and like seeing their names, but they're not really part of it. Although, mother daughter speak, uh, we included um, your old boss, so her older brother's poem, yeah. and he designed the cover, so that was exciting. I thought I saw an article that one of your sons wrote once. Mm -hmm. My older son? Yeah. Yeah, so they, um, yeah, I've co-written a lot mm -hmm. with my older son, either for Huffington or some other place. So he actually enjoyed writing, and I thought maybe we could, I could do a book with him, but he got too busy and then he went off to college, so um, Elizabeth and I were able to do it. I was her second choice. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. It was just you know pecking order. If you were born first, or <laughs> but you know as a writer, you just always everything is surrounding a book. You know you're just thinking about a book. So <laughs> that's what happened. So yeah. any event, you know, you're always thinking, oh, can a book come out of this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so can a book kind of come out of my kids? You know that because when they were younger, I always thought not co-writing with them, but writing about them. I thought of doing, but I just, I, I don't want to embarrass them too much. So when they get a little older, maybe a co writer. Although I embarrass them, is, you know, when I lecture or when I preach, I talk about them. Yeah. I just sit there shaking my head. <laughs> they're, good, they're, they're a good source of uh, humiliation, you know, of stories that you can use. But everyone can relate to them. It's yeah. not like, you know. I'm sure you did. I don't know. Maybe you may not do that to your kids, but I've done it. Oh, in my family, I have to run the stories past oh, the kids first. Yeah, so sometimes, I, yeah, sometimes <laughs> I run it by them, but some things I think they're kind of universal stories, and those I don't. Yeah. How do you think being an Asian American woman affects your faith? I think it had such a big impact. Mm -hmm. On me. If I think I was a born Asian American or Asian, a Korean woman, all my theology would have been different. I think that part of my identity has shaped my whole 
theological stance and view and how I teach and write. And just who I am. It's just so much part of me. As a kid, I wanted to run away from it. I was so embarrassed to be Korean. And there's so many stories of me being embarrassed because people made fun of what I did or ate or just how I looked. But, you know, now as an adult, well, immigration is more prevalent. And people know where Korea is, and people know Korea. Uh, but, you know, still the systemic racism is there. But, you know, who thought I could come to Australia and eat kimchi? You know, the other day we had kimchi <laughs> at our minister's house. But the fact that it's not just Koreans eating it, people are, you know, around the world are eating it. The impact of Korean culture, K pop, um, K drama is worldwide. But I think. You know, um, how a person understands God and come to experience God, people have to recognize you come to know God through your experiences. And my experience is so um, uh, shaped by my identity, how people treat me. Because if I was a white male, people would treat me differently. If I was a white woman, people would treat me differently. So as a Korean American woman, people do treat me um, in a certain way, um, and I'm always conscious of that. Um, always conscious of how uh, people of color are treated and accepted. Because your theology is is very broad and you know it's it's far reaching. So yeah. you're dealing with questions around gender and ethnicity and race and theology, and then drawing in. Um, Asian religious ideas, and so there's a lot of breadth mm -hmm. to your theology, and it's it's interesting how your experience and your identity is connected to the breadth of the theological work that you're doing as well. Yeah, so um, about five years ago, Duke Divinity School they interviewed me for their uh, magazine, and they said, you know, you write all over the place. You know, you're writing about climate change, racism, gender, mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, um, Sophia, and so they kind of asked it in a way like, oh, you know, you're, you're kind of, they weren't say scattered, but you know, you're writing all over the place. And then my response then and my response today is it's still all very connected. They're yeah, all moved definitely. together because mm. that all whole thing mm. is part of who I am too. I'm concerned about gender issues and Asian American issues and climate change because they're all kind of connected and it's all kind of connected with the Holy Spirit. So I think even in our book, we talked about the Spirit of God, because those things are all weaved together. You can't kind of separate them. And I think that is the whole thing about intersectionality, that these all kind of intersect. And so my writing is kind of showing how the intersectionality kind of comes alive. So even though I'm talking about climate change, underneath it, there's this understanding of no, the notion of uh, racial, uh, of uh, Holy Spirit and also um, the racism and how uh, people of color, are, particularly in the U.S., are affected by climate change more than white people. So, you know, we have pollution going into the poor countries where the people of color live. The water are more polluted in those areas and so forth. So um, we have to be aware of those. Yeah, I think there's a temptation in Western culture to kind of separate things into silos and yes. yeah. um, the work that you're doing, all of those intersections and connections are there, but your ability to do that, so much of that, as you've indicated, is about your identity too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, so who I am affects yeah. my theology and who Elizabeth is affects yeah. her, so her as a dancer, as yeah. you asked her questions. That affected a lot, and that came in the book, too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. What do you most admire about your mother? <laughs> um, I admire that she's able to do so many things. You're putting her and on the spot. She has to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> She's uh, a big multitasker, but in a good way. Um, I think through everything that she does, she isn't just half of like her commitment and her time is only in half of this and half of that. She dedicates a lot of her time and commitment to one thing, but is able to do that with all the other things that she's a part of as well. Um, all this while also being a mom of three, 
which is so difficult. And you know, she's traveling a lot, but she always is there for us if we need anything. And I, I respect that, that she's able to put a lot on her plate, but still do everything with grace. And Thank you. And what, what do you appreciate the most about um, your daughter and her gifts? Um, so she's a great multitasker too. Um, yeah, I think yeah. I get it from you actually. <laughs> you know? So whenever I say something and I'm complaining to my friends about, gosh, she's doing too much and I want her to do less, their first response is, she's just like you. <laughs> so, so I guess she gets it from me. But, um, you know, in high school, I was telling her, you got to do less. You know, you got to concentrate in the school, but she was doing like student council. She was writing for the local newspaper and then her school paper. And she was, I don't know, doing mini mini thon. She was a student rep. She does sound like you. I know. And then she was dancing. And dancing was <laughs> huge. Oh, and then she was in the school theater. She was in school. I was like, you know, SAT is important. Your grades are important. She still graduated top 10, which is astounding. And she's going to Cornell in the fall. So she did really well. But, I, you know, as a mom, I was so scared. You know, college is like the priority here. Not student council and mini thought and all the other. But she was able to do it all and then also write the book. So, yeah, I, that's very admiring. I, I, when I was younger, I, at that age, I thought I did a lot too. So looking back, you know, I was always busy, but it's nothing compared to what she did. Yeah. <laughs> I'm saying that one, okay. <laughs> What's your hope for your daughter? So, you know, there's lots of hope, you know. In many ways, I wish you could just continue the dance and maybe major that, major in that in, in school. But then a part of me is like, you know, a dancer, there's so many limitations of your career. And so I'm really torn. I was torn like that in high school and I was trying to take her out of dance because I wanted her to concentrate on her school. But she, she wanted to do it so much, so she um, continued. I think um, to be a good, faithful, um, Asian American woman and share that in whatever career or, or if she is going to be a stay at home mom, but whatever she does, um, that that will be still very important to her. Um, she loves to dance and so she'll continue to dance and to write. You know, writing, you know, she wrote for her school paper and then she also wrote for the local newspaper and she got paid for that. It wasn't much, but it was always exciting to get a check in the mail yeah. for her writing uh, for the local newspaper. So, you know, just continue to do what she likes and she's good at so many things. So she has to narrow it down mm -hmm. too because she has so many talents. <laughs> and she plays piano and she did other musical things. She was in the school choir. <laughs> so she has to narrow it down. Is, is there anything else that you want to say to us about mother-daughter relationships or about any of the issues that we talked about this morning? Understanding that no relationship is perfect. And I think I've definitely understood that process when we were writing the book together. Um, but also in the times where it gets difficult to turn to God and your faith, go to the Bible, um, and really just... Don't be afraid to communicate with your mother or daughter or um, son or father, whatever it is. Um, don't be afraid to communicate your feelings because I think that's the best way you can <laughs> overcome the struggles. In it. Yes. So when I do the book talks, you know, I carry different kinds of books. And everybody's so excited that there's a book, Mother Daughter. So you know, a lot of mothers who come, they can't wait to buy it for their daughter and read it together. So I'm hoping that um, it will have an impact and people can read it together and hopefully uh, bring more bonding to uh, mother and daughters. And not just mother and daughter because it's just, you know, this perspective is just for one person and another person, but it can be applied to father, son, uh, aunts and uncles to their niece and nephew. So it's just... You know, it's titled Mother Daughter Speak. It's not just for women, it's for men too, because the relationships are, you know, the dynamics exist in all those different relationships, even amongst friends, how friends can build relationships and have different perspectives on an issue and still be good, have a good relationship at the end of the day. 
So we're hoping that, you know, it's just not just women that are reading. But Graham, you can read it with your daughter too. <laughs> I'm Grace G. Sun Kim and Elizabeth Safia Lee. Thank you for joining us for the Global Church Project. Well, thank you so much for doing this, especially yeah. in person in Sydney. So this is yeah. very exciting. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. The Global Church Project is located at www.theglobalchurchproject.com. On our website, you'll find a wide range of interviews and resources for colleges, universities, and churches. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.